So how do you personally feel about leftovers? Hmm? Some, like Thanksgiving, I'm good with that. Pasta sauces sometimes taste better the next day. That, that's just chemistry, right? Loud for the flavors to mingle. And a good masaman curry from a Thai restaurant when there's enough to have lunch the next day, oh, that's good stuff. But a green leafy salad that already has dressing on it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And most meats reheated don't taste great to me. So it's, it's a mixed bag. Well, I'm inviting us to ponder leftovers, and we were in the lighting of the Christ candle time as well, because a lot of Christian ministry and mission is centered in leftovers. That it's often about what people do after they've already satisfied their own wants, needs, and desires. And then there is a giving what's left to people who may be in various forms of need. Uh, the the day-old baked goods taken from the, the business that wants to donate them. There is many a youth group room in a church building furnished with the dilapidated couches from church members. And of course, there, I mean, there's people who give good stuff too, but even often that good stuff is being given after our own needs, wants, and desires are met. It's what's left over. And I was thinking about a story that had gone viral a few years back. I first read it in the Huffington Post, and it was one of those, a bad thing happened, and someone turned it into a good thing. It was a feel-good story, and, and it is. I think it's a good story. So there was this groom who pulled out of his wedding at the last minute. Oh, right, that's the bad part. But then the bride, and it had to be hard, right, to pivot, to think creatively, but she decided to donate the $35,000 wedding reception to other people. And so the flowers went to, an, to residents of a nearby nursing home, for example, and folks from a homeless shelter were brought in to enjoy the catered meal. And so that was, that was nice, right? Better than throwing it away. But then there isn't so many questions after the media attention and everyone felt good about that, then we all move on. She might have moved on as well. I don't know her personally. But then there's the next day, when the homeless people still are homeless and still feeling food insecurity. And what happens, I mean, it was, I'm sure, lovely to get those flowers in some of those rooms in the nursing home, but they eventually fade and they're going to get tossed, and some of those folks still don't even get visitors, and they're still going to be lonely. Now, now, don't hear me too quickly. I'm all for, if there's leftovers, share them. I brought donations for the rummage sale myself, Right? Right? Share them, do something good with them, but there's still this challenge is that often it stops there for many folk. That like, shared my leftovers, aren't I great? Or at least good or decent, and then we move on. But then there's still all the different issues and situations and systems in place. So sometimes when we just share our leftovers and move on, we actually end up not meaning to, but supporting the harmful systems that are in place because we don't do anything about them. And so that's tricky. And as people following in the way of Jesus, where we hear, seek first the reign of God, that's about living in ways that are transformed and bringing transformation into the world. And just sharing leftovers and moving on doesn't tend to bring transformation. Might do something nice for a moment, but then things just stay the way they are. So why would we ever be satisfied with that? To just give what's left and move on. Well, I think it comes naturally, and I mean that quite literally. And I think about evolution and biological systems. If an organism is really good at surviving and accumulating resources, then that organism is going to be better at passing on its genes next generation, right? So you all here, all of us, we come from a long line of survivors, right? Of creatures that knew how to make it, how to make sure there was enough. But the thing that, that the evolutionary system doesn't do is help you know when to turn it off. Right? That's not always so clear. I think about how helpful it is that when you fill up your gas tank, that the system knows when the gas tank's full and clicks it off. Because one time I was doing that and it didn't work, and guess what happened? It makes a mess. So when you don't know when you have enough, it can also make a mess. It can do harm. 
So I think about that there can be this sense of, well, now I have enough, but what if something bad happens? So there's this focus to get some more. I need some reserves. I need savings. I need whatever. I need a bigger house or I need Costco, right? Costco exists because there's a sense that we don't know when to turn it off. So, but then now it's like, okay, now I've got a cushion. But then the question is, is that enough of a cushion? Is that enough resources? Do I have enough rolls of toilet paper? Do, I, right, do we have enough bathrooms? Right, so it just can keep going and going and going. So we end up on a kind of hamster wheel of anxiety of trying to make sure we have enough and secure our own survival. And when we're living in that way, well, that's kind of hellish for us, even if we're not always conscious of it, because we're living in fear and anxiety and scarcity. But it also creates a situation where we can't really do much for other people. We don't have much capacity when other people are struggling or suffering or the systems aren't working. And so sometimes the best we can do is toss a few leftovers and then get back on the wheel. But then this keeps those systems and structures in place that create hellish conditions for others. So the good news is Jesus came to save us from hell. And you see where I'm going with that? So yeah, I'm not talking so much about an afterlife destination, but the ways that for ourselves and others we create hellish conditions. And Jesus comes to embody God's love and say there's a better way. And there's ways that we are focused on our survival, our stuff, our things, but it leaves us anxious and grasping and forming and supporting systems that leave other people anxious and grasping and hurting. By the way, this, I think, is what Paul meant in the letter when he says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That it's that focus, that devotion to making sure we're securing our own wants and needs and desires that then results in all kinds of hurt and harm. And Jesus says, there's a better way that you can let go of focusing first there and center in spirit, in the embodiment of love and goodness, and that transforms us and we can be part of transforming the world. And so, as I've talked about before, when Jesus had something important to say, he tells a story. So we have a story here, and this story maybe needs a little more, I'm going to say, background material to, to understand it. Uh, because on the surface, this story has often been used to scare people. Anyone ever heard this story used to scare you? Right? You're going to burn in the hot, hot fires of hell. Right? See, I hold back on you. So some of us heard it that way. So let's, let's first ponder that for the people hearing this story, and through most of the history of Israel, of Judaism, there wasn't much focus on what we would call the afterlife. A primary way of thinking, the default way of thinking was when you die, you're dead. And the way you live on is through your descendants or your legacy, what you do in the world. There was this idea that there was this sort of shadowy underworld. It was called Sheol, and it gets translated in your Bibles as grave. And the, the notion was you were there and you were just resting in peace. And there's still old tombstones that say rest in peace. It actually harkens back to that idea and tradition. So you're just resting there in peace. Then there's some various crises that happen. One of them is the Babylonian invasion of Israel. And Jerusalem's destroyed. The temple's gone. Many people are killed. People experiment called Israel that was meant to bless the world. It's over. It's done. It's hopeless. Everything's falling apart. All the systems, all the structures, all the institutions are failing us. What can we do? Sound familiar? So there were prophets who were listening for how God is still speaking, and they heard God say, and they shared with the people, God's saying, it, it's not over. If just a remnant, if just a few of you will stay in me, will stay centered in me, there's hope for the world. Don't give up, don't quit, keep on keeping on. And so there was this idea that emerged that God would make all things new that God had not quit or given up. God was committed to a renewal and transformation of this world. Then a question emerged. What about the people who didn't make it for this whole renewal thing? Right? There's people who have died, lots of faithful, good people. And so emerged a thinking in Israel of this idea called resurrection. Now, this was not a disembodied soul that goes off somewhere. This was the idea that those waiting in peace, resting in peace in the grave, that God would bodily resurrect them so they could participate when the time was right in a restored world. So they wouldn't miss out. So even though you died before the world was made better, 
the just world for all, you missed it. God's saying, no, you don't have to miss it. Resurrecting people, and they get to be part of it. Yay. So, by the way, in our Christian story, when you hear resurrection, that's what they're talking about. The physical, bodily something that happens in this world. Well, then other questions emerge. Well, wait a minute. What about the bad people? What about the people who didn't love God and did harm? If you resurrect them and plop them in this restored world, aren't they just going to undo it? Aren't they going to mess it up? Oh. By the way, I'm describing centuries of thought and wrestling. And, and a really, it's a paraphrase. So, but what starts to emerge is some ideas about sorting it out. So everything from the day of judgment on this day of resurrection and sorting people out to one realm of thinking that some rabbis taught, which there were essentially two sections in Sheol, in the grave. There was the section for the people who were already in right relationship with God, who were ready for the, the world to come, who were ready for a just world for all. And so they just kept resting in peace. And sometimes that was called being gathered to your ancestors. Sometimes it was called resting in the bosom of Abraham. But gathered in this peaceful embrace of the family that's gone before. And you're resting there until Resurrection Day. Then there was the other section. And in that section, you went there if you'd lived disconnected from God and lived in ways of alienation. And the purpose of it was to see how you'd done harm that you became conscious and aware of the way you'd lived apart from God and alienated from neighbor and your true self. And it was torturous. It was hard to see that and experience that. However, the purpose was that the person, even in that next realm of the grave, could turn around, could learn a better way. The whole idea was always about everyone is to be part of this restoration. Everyone is to be part of this new world. And you can't be part of the new world if you don't see how you messed up in the old one. And so that was the idea. So keep that in mind, because we have to understand that to understand the story before us. Also keep in mind that when Jesus tells this story, he is not offering his doctoral dissertation on the afterlife. Jesus is telling a story using one of numerous stories and understandings of what happened after we died. It's not that he's necessarily endorsing it or saying this is how it will work when you die. It'd be a little bit like if after worship one of you came up to me and wanted to tell me a joke. And it starts out with, so Michael, these three people die and they go up to the pearly gates and there's St. Peter. Now I know, odds are, that the person telling me this story does not think that afterlife paradise is a gated community necessarily. Nor do they have the picture that those gates are literally made from the excrement of bivalves. Nor do they likely think that Peter, who was this lead disciple, has been relegated to bouncer of paradise, right? But they know, we all know that story, right? We, they were familiar with the image, so they're going to use familiar images, so I'll be on board. So all of that, I think, is at work here. So in the story, we have a guy who wears purple every day. And that's not just about a, a color palette obsession. Purple was the most expensive dye in the ancient world. And so it was the equivalent of he wears only designer clothing, never buys off the rack, only has the tailor-made stuff. Secondly, the other thing we're told about him is that he feasts sumptuously. Most people in the hearing of this story did not have enough to eat each day. So if you had enough, you were considered rich. So if someone feasted sumptuously, this was the upper, 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 upper echelon of wealth. So this person is about as wealthy as anyone in the ancient world could imagine in the story Jesus tells. Notice also, and this is a little surprising, Jesus is subversive. I'm just going to let you know. He does not tell the name of the rich guy, but he tells us the name of the poor person. And do you notice that it often is the opposite, right? In our own culture, right? In our own culture, our own time and place, there are people who don't have hardly anything, who've been in the dark for days in Puerto Rico. And we keep hearing 
about nonstop coverage of a queen who died, who wasn't even our queen. And we hear her name over and over again. We do not hear the names of the people in the dark in Puerto Rico because that's how the world works. So Jesus is flipping that. Rich person, no name. Lazarus gets a name. So we also hear that Lazarus is outside the, the gates of his household every day, of the rich person's household. And most likely what's happening is in that time and place, if for whatever reason you were an adult but could not work, could not feed yourself or contribute to your family, then your job became begging. Because most people, even in the families, they don't have enough to support another adult. And so how do you support the household? So they would take the family member and place them somewhere where they at least could get fed and maybe get a little extra to contribute to the household. So most likely, this Lazarus' family would drop him at the gates each morning so that at least he would get something to eat. And we get a hint about why Lazarus is not working. He's very ill. He has open sores on his body. And the person with all the resources who probably had whatever would be the best medically available salves and herbs in their household doesn't offer a thing. The only comfort for Lazarus are dogs in the neighborhood licking. It's really a pathetic, horrible image. Now, the man, though, rich guy with no name, he's not evil, even from the perspective of the story. Because what's implied here is that Lazarus gets the scraps from the table. They're giving him his, their leftovers. So they're feasting sumptuously. They got so much they got leftovers, and they give them to Lazarus. So that la that's why he keeps coming back every day, because there's some food. There's leftovers being handed out to Lazarus. And I'll tell you, even by our own society standards, I'm on, anyone familiar with Nextdoor? It's an app or, where you learn about what's going on in your neighborhoods. Well, so I'm up in Oro Valley, and I can tell you from reading the comments and the things in those neighborhoods in Oro Valley in the Northwest, that if someone was dumping off their family member with open sores at the gated entrance to neighborhoods, there would not be a meal train starting. There would not be people bringing leftovers. The police would be called. There's a scary person here. Get rid of them. Right? So the rich guy doesn't do that. He has the leftovers. All right. Seems all right. Well, then both the rich man and Lazarus die because no one gets out of here alive. And then in the story we hear, and this would have been a surprise to some of the hearers, the poor person, Lazarus, is in the bosom of Abraham. He's in right relationship with God. He's resting in peace. He's ready for the world to come. Because you see, some people thought that if you were poor and ill, you must be a sinner. You must be bad and God must hate you. So this was a surprise to some of the people. Like, what? The poor guy is there? Oh. And then even more surprising, because people thought rich people were favored by God. Well, if you have all that money and power, God's hand must be upon you. And he is in the bad section of the underworld. By the way, Hades is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Sheol. It all means the grave. So he is in this place, unnamed rich guy, where he experiences life without all of his comforts and security. Because... It's stripped away now. You can't take it with you, right? We even say that. So he didn't get to take it with him, and now he can see what he lived in his privilege and his power and position, what he did and what he didn't do. He likely is awake to now the fact that he could have transformed Lazarus' life, and all he did was throw a few scraps his way. And that is torturous. And so he's in this torment, and though notice, and I think that's why it's this process, like he's, it's hopefully eventually it gets him to shift and turn and understand what he needs to do and live. But no, he's, he, it takes a while to unlearn your privilege because he thinks he's calling the shots. He's given order. You Abraham and you send Lazarus to go do this, right? He thinks he's in charge still, even while he's in torment. Some of us are slow learners. I, as you can see, I'm including myself in that. And Abraham, when he says go, so he also, it's not like, oh my gosh, um, could Lazarus go and let everyone know that we really could do more, that we really could transform lives? No, it's like, could you just have him take care of my brothers so that they're not in trouble too? It's still about his 
nearest and dearest. And so Abraham comes back with, listen, even if someone is raised from the dead, they won't be convinced. And that's this reminder that resurrection, new life, is most valuable when people are already looking for it, when we're hungering for hope and signs of life. If we're stuck in our own pain and struggle and hamster wheel, we won't even catch resurrection when it happens. That's why, by the way, in the resurrection stories of Jesus, he does not, I mean, because a lot of us want to know why. Why didn't Jesus show up with Pilate and do like a mic drop? Boom, I'm back. But he only appears to the people who are seeking and yearning, not to the people stuck. Because resurrection only matters when we're seeking and yearning for new life. And so the whole story is this wake-up call to all the ways that we are on that hamster wheel, that we get stuck in kind of a hellish, anxious way of living that keeps systems and structures in place that are hellish and anxious for other people. And Jesus is saying, not so we're afraid of where we go when we die, but so we live differently now. So we can make different choices now. So our love isn't for our security and our stuff and our comfort, but we love first God and justice and healing and hope and that we are centered in there and then we live it in the world, not just offering what's left over, but offering ourselves and our best, because that's where the transformation is. I was invited to lunch by the principal of an elementary school. It was, the school was in the neighborhood where my church was in the center of a city, and I was volunteering. The school had a tutoring program, and I was one of the tutors. And then this principal had learned that the senior minister from that nearby church was there, and he wanted to introduce himself and get to know each other. I was newer in the community. So we're having lunch, and he explains that he had grown up in the same neighborhood where the church was. And that his father had worked in a factory, and that times were sometimes tough. Sometimes they did all right, but he'd get laid off. And then the family had all kinds of economic insecurity, and so they would go to the food pantry in the neighborhood, and they would need food from there. And he said, back in that day, the primary people staffing the food pantry were volunteers from the church I was now serving. And he said, so his father would remind them to feel thankful and to give thanks when they were given the things. And he said, and he did. He recognized his family wouldn't have made it without this help. He said, but sometimes, you know, he said, I was aware that there were these really nice, clean, well-dressed ladies in there, and they were giving us stuff that you knew they would never eat. And so I would sometimes feel ashamed and wonder, what's wrong with me? And he said some were really kind and warm, but there were others who had the sense of you could feel their superiority. And so we were getting help, but it was tinged with something that wasn't as beautiful. He said, and part of why I came to recognize that was there was this other woman who wasn't part of your church, he said to me, she went to a different church. She'd grown up in that neighborhood, and as a matter of fact, she'd been a recipient of the resources of the food pantry at different times. And for her, she was wanting to give back to this organization and this uh, resource that had helped her. And he said, and she just showed up in such a different way. One, we would come there, and she'd give us hugs, and she knew our names, and she made us feel welcome. And, and, and she would be conspiratorial, he'd said, because sometimes there'd be like, we'd have these sort of dusty canned goods that you knew came from the back of someone's pantry that they never were going to touch. And she's like, oh, no, you don't want that. Let's find you something good. And she'd rummage around and bring out something better. And he said, and there was always this one business in town that donated their, their, their day-old baked goods. But on her day, and he said, she didn't have much, but she would bake us fresh bread. And she'd bring cookies for the children. And so this food pantry, I was getting help from both kinds of people. But one left me feeling a tinge of shame, and the other left me feeling loved and like I mattered. And what I got from this woman from my neighborhood was inspiration. And what I thought to myself was, well, one day I want to grow up and be like her. And he said, and here I am serving as the principal of an elementary school that I went to as a child. And I'm still hoping and praying that one day I will grow up to be like her. Amen.